A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. October 22nd, 1962. Do any of you know the significance of the date? At approximately 8 p.m. Eastern Time, the major networks broke from regular programming to air a startling message from the White House. Speaking on behalf of his entire administration, President Kennedy announced that the Soviet Union was deploying short and intermediate range missiles in Cuba, meaning a spring-loaded nuclear threat was 90 miles beyond the coast of Florida. At that point, the president had been aware of this offensive buildup since spy plane photos had been placed on his desk six days before. For those of you around at the time, you may remember the stunning address from the Oval Office and what ensued after the announcement. Thirteen agonizingly tense days of rumors, alerts, preparation, fear. Air rings scrambled, soldiers and Marines mobilized, naval blockades readied for any eventuality. From hardened bunkers 5,000 miles apart, threats and counter threats were made. The chess pieces of all out war moved cautiously and deliberately by two heads of state. A misstep by Khrushchev or Kennedy could lead to unimaginable agony for every person on the planet. All of that potential energy, unbridled power, could be unleashed in under a minute with a phone call and a series of codes. With great power comes great responsibility. This maxim has been attributed to Voltaire, Lincoln, FDR, Churchill, even Ben Parker, the fictional dad of the incredible Spider-Man. It doesn't really matter who said it first. It's far more important to appreciate the intent of the words. Those entrusted with power in the Oval Office, on a warship, in the C-suite of a company, behind the gavel in a courtroom, must always respect the source and purpose of their power, exercising authority or showing restraint in the right measures at the appropriate moments. With great power comes great responsibility. This applies to all of us as well. It's a reminder that what every one of us says and does as disciples of Jesus, as insignificant as the saying and doing seems sometimes, may have significant potential energy. The power, you might say, to build or tear down, include or dismiss, set free or bind. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out that fault when the two of you are alone. With this introductory statement, Jesus puts a challenging paradigm before his disciples, a model of practicing forgiveness and reconciliation within the life of the community. 
His timing is exquisite, of course. A larger conversation is underway at this point about power. A few minutes ago, one of the disciples asked Jesus, who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? You remember that part of the conversation, don't you? It's the kind of question one lifts up when they're seeking affirmation, not information. The disciples are already jockeying for positions of influence, power within Jesus' circle. It's human nature, I suppose. The quest to sit as close to the head of the table as possible. Now, other gospel accounts are a bit more explicit. Teacher, tell us who's the number one guy. Jesus takes a child, plops her in the middle of the gathered throng and says, here you go. Become like her if you seek the kingdom. And don't put stumbling blocks in the paths of those like this little one who are coming to me. Now the table is set. Jesus has called out the disciples on their power seeking He's elevated the lowly of the world, the least of these as the greatest, and he's also put the disciples on notice about the responsibilities that come with their power. Simply put, get out of the way of those trying to deepen their relationship with me. With all of this before his disciples, Jesus now pivots toward forgiveness and reconciliation. If someone sins against you, go to that person and let them know about it. If they listen, thanks be to God for the restoration. If they don't, go back to them. Bring one or two witnesses this time. Air the grievance again in hopes that they may listen. But if they will not, take it to the church. Go through the process again, and only then, only after the one who offends you has refused your multiple overtures toward forgiveness and reconciliation, are you able to cut them off, like you might distance yourself from a Gentile or tax collector. Putting an exclamation point on all that's at stake here, Jesus then says, Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The implication is obvious. The one we despise is loved by God. The one we want nowhere near us and the people we love is a child of God. So when we extend forgiveness to that untouchable adversary, Jesus is present. God is glorified. The unimaginable may happen. Go to them, Jesus says. Name your grievance. Restore them if they listen. It's a high bar, isn't it? Some lofty expectations for our power usage for my power usage now i've mentioned my white hot anger before when someone crosses a line with me i'm predisposed to seek the guillotine not the olive branch the power to condemn not the power to restore and i'm in good company Peter, who's disturbed by the implications of what Jesus has declared about forgiveness and reconciliation, will soon test the boundaries of the teaching. What if the same person keeps offending me, Jesus? How many times should I offer forgiveness to the habitual offender? Peter asks a great question, but he won't receive the answer he desires. Instead, he hears the answer that he needs to hear at that moment in his life. 
With great power comes great responsibility. Every one of us has right here within us, within these temples of flesh and spirit, a power with far more potential than the power vested in the Oval Office, the Kremlin, the bridge of an aircraft carrier, or the instrument panel of a bomber. We have the power to forgive as we have been forgiven, the power to restore because we have been raised in Christ. With this unrivaled power comes unequaled responsibility. The responsibility to draw people together, not push them farther apart. Church, we have the power to do what no power on earth can do. Bring people together. Jesus is always our source and our model. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, he says, I am there among them. Amen.